impulsive, full of energy, and takes on anything he can get, get his hands on, got hold of me a year ago, I think it was, of thereabouts, and said, would you come and talk? Well, a year is a long time to me. I don't think I'll be alive next year. And I said, sure. Well, I know he forgot about it, and I forgot about it. He called me on the phone one day and reminded me. <laughs> so here I am. And you're looking at me and you're saying, <laughs> this guy looks like a long distance runner lost his way. What's he doing here? Well, the truth of it is, I haven't weight trained and it had nothing really to do with injuries as a police officer. I had my share. But basically, it was from playing basketball. Uh, lifting weights was my number one love, but basketball in Indiana is where you're a man or not. And, and I had a trouble with my manhood most of my life, trying to prove myself. So I'd play basketball with the black guys on the Y, and they'd test your manhood real quick. And I remember my last year that I played basketball down here, about, when I was about 53 years old. I played full court with the young guys on, during the day, and they, you know, they, they would put you out of there some way or another if you didn't want to really stay. But I remember you, what you would do was you would play basketball, and when your team got beat, why well, you get to sign back up. Well, I couldn't. I got the place couldn't even sit down because it get too stiff. So what I would do is I'd walk back and forth until my time came up to play again. Because if I sit down, I was in trouble. So that's how I really got messed up. Right? No longer can lift weights and what have you. And I'll try to be a little bit. I know nobody, I kept a looking at you, that nobody here really is interested in hearing about powerlifting, but I'll cover it as much as I can without making it too uninteresting. How many guys are interested in powerlifting or women? Okay. I'll cover it the best I can and still make it, I hope, interesting. Uh, I was very interested a while ago in what Howard had to say because he was talking in my day and age. Uh, I trained at uh, Leo Stern's gym, a great gym. And uh, to this day in my gym, I got nobody who can touch some of the guys I was telling Howard doing inclines. Everybody there could do dumbbell inclines. It was amazing. I mean, that's what they done, because Clancy Ross done them, and Leo Stern and Clancy were buddies. And you had to learn how to handle them dumbbells. But, I mean, I was very interested in what he had to say because that was my day and age. And, uh, Again, I told Bob, you know, I tried to talk it out. You don't really talk him out of much, I don't think. I could have said, Flat ain't coming. Why don't you come down and make me come? Yeah, I know he come to Indiana and drag me. <laughs> but he's just the kind of guy that he said good things. And he said enough good things about me to me. That I didn't know how he knew me. But he said a lot of good things about me, and I got, well, that's nice. And he said, well, you're going to come? Yeah, I'll come, you know. But, but anyway, powerlifting, already in, this, in, in, in here, you've already got a crowd for a powerlifting meet if you've never been to one. So powerlifting is about the guy doing it. Because the guys that run powerlifting have never caught on about how to run anything. The best I was ever at was right here in, in New York. There, it, it was a guy that won a deadlift meet up there, one of the deadlift nationals. And that guy had, a, had some class about him. I can't, I can't remember his name. Who? Right. Big Italian guy. And this guy would run these contests with a suit on and he'd have all these guys working for him. And for some reason, he's about 6'4", 300. They'd done what he said. But he wasn't a mean guy. He didn't even look mean. And he had some guys working for him that looked pretty mean. But anyway, he, he, he got the job done because he had a way about him. And he, he also understood that when you go to a powerlift and meet, you'd like to be able to find it when you get there one thing and he would take a take a hotel and he'd put a barbell out there and he'd put balloons on it. He had a big banner that one of my lifters stole and I had to send it back. A big banner, welcome to the Deadlift Nationals and that kind of thing. He had that kind of class about him and he he done a good job. We just returned from a Masters National NASA meet. And NASA does a good job with their we don't enter many NASA meets but we entered their Masters Nationals, which had 160 lifters, and they done a pretty good job. We just won that. 
because I'm, my, a lot of my lifters are masters now since I've been dealing with powerlifting since 1974. I had my first uh, powerlifting team in 1974, so we should have won a lot of things in that length of time because most powerlifting meets only got one team, see? And you enter your team, and you're the only team there, so you win a national championship. It ain't quite that bad, but it's close. So, you know, you can get a lot of reputation and not know much if you know how to organize a powerlifting team. <laughs> and the way you organize a powerlifting team is you can get about all these big guys or a dime a dozen. You get you some 114 pounders, you get some 123 pounders, 132 pounders, you're ready. If you have two in each class, you already got the first and the second, the first and the second, first, you already got the sixth place. And the rest of these guys in 181 and up, they're all fighting each other and they don't come in. They got a good lifter, been lifting weights for 10 years. He can total 1,400 pounds and he ends up in sixth place. He don't get nothing for you. You interest those guys, you interest those guys, get you some points. So I realized a long time ago that drug lifters don't do you no good either. Now, I got an 800 pound squatter, one of them that I've had the first time in the history of that gym. And he got nothing to do with me. It's got to do with him. It's got to do with his daddy and mommy. Because he's a great guy. And, and I wouldn't talk about the guy in any way but possible. But he wouldn't know a hard work out if he'd stand on one. <laughs> and I ain't gonna mention his name because eventually he's gonna be on the front of power left in USA. He's a great guy. He's a tremendous physical specimen. And his idea of a workout is definitely brief. He'll come in and squat up to about 550 and go home. And he might do leg presses. But I'll tell you one thing, you don't never get hurt. <laughs> he ain't never left a weight that's going to hurt him. There's no way. The man will squat 900 pounds in the near future, and he's, he's, going, he's bent over 500, and he's dead up to 700 and thereabouts. And he'll, his dead up. We'll, we'll go up some, he'll be about a 750 dead lifter and what have you, a 550 bencher. And he is drug free, they test him every time. And he, if he would not get rid of him, but I've been around him for years. But another thing that masks how to train and what the truth is, is the genetics that people have. A really gifted man, and I hate to say this in front of you guys, but some of you are gifted, has a tendency not to want to train too hard. Why should he? Now, sometimes he does because he recognizes, hey, I'm pretty good. And what I do gets a lot for me. But that's, that, that, that's usually not the average guy. Scott Studwell, how many of you are familiar with Scott Studwell? Played linebacker for Minnesota for 15 years, 14. Studwell was trained at the pit when he was a high school boy and, and, and a lot thereafter. I think that only, if he had played one more year, he would have held a record for middle linebackers. And he holds probably ever tackling record at Minnesota. He broke Buckets' record as, for, for the one year senior record. And he'd done it when he was, he was an alcoholic. He finally had to take dry up to, when he was a pro football player so he could uh, keep on playing. He was so genetically gifted that, that, that he was my dream. I thought, man, if I could get this cat to just go to Mr. America, I'd just make him famous. I told him one day, I said, train for six months and go win Mr. America and we'll both be famous. He thought that's the funniest thing he ever heard. He, he, was, he arm wrestled in the NFL one time, if you, if you may not know about it, for a couple of years they had an arm wrestling championship in Vegas. He won it the first year, and second year he got second. I, I asked him one day, I said, did anybody ever teach you how to arm wrestle? He said, everybody. Meaning, hey man, I don't need to know nothing about arm wrestling. I got an arm, you know. But this guy was just a phenomenally put together man. He had, he had one knee surgery in his career of pro football. That was in college. He was just a phenomenal big guy. But he would, I'm going to tell you, if you want to write down his workout, it won't take you long. He goes sits on the bench. And everybody's eyes get toward him. And he does a few, a few popping benches with no weight, probably 300 pounds would be at his max. He would then go do a couple of dips, a couple sets of dips, and he'd do a tricep press and he's gone. That's what he done. I never seen him do anything else. Except one time he done a leg extension when he had a knee hurt. I, I talked him into that, but 
and neat how that stuff. But I mean, that's what Scott stood well done. Now, if I was in a gym, this, I'm talking about masking. If I'm in a gym and Scott Studwell's in a gym, who do you think they're going to ask how to train? That's right. So just because a guy has a good build or a guy has comes up here and tells you that his team won nine national championships and 19 state championships, doesn't mean he really knows anything. It does mean he knows how to organize. I didn't know how to organize those guys. Now, the best way to organize is have money. Now, before I got married to the wife I have now, I had some money. I, had a, I was a policeman, and I had a gym, and I was single. And I had a van, and I'd load these power lifters up, and I'd take them for a ride. And we could pretty well beat anybody. We could, you know, we've been challenged that we couldn't have beat the guys from New York. Well, let me tell you something. If New York would have had to come to Evansville, they'd have got beat. By the time you get them there, you lose half of them, unless you're carrying them. you got to get them in that van and take them, you know. And I can't try to get, I can put a 25-man powerlifting team out there when I'm really into it. But you can't get 25 guys to a contest unless you've got an airplane. It ain't like pro football. These guys got to pay their way, they got to pay their hotel, they got to eat, they got to pay their entry fees, they got to pay all those kind of things. So that's a lot of work to get a powerlifting team somewhere. So I would take that van and that's how I basically won. I would do all kind of things to get the guys in the van. I had a teenage powerlifting team that, that, that was really good at one time and I ruined them a couple of times because I'd take them out and let them see the city before. And they'd get to the place they couldn't even lift. And then I decided one day that I'm going to have to put mess around these teenagers because they're going to get me killed and them killed, and, and I'm going to get a lawsuit that I ain't going to handle. So I, about 10 years ago, I could walk away from the teenagers and the pilot. But I certainly enjoyed dealing with them. But the, 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 the reason that I had a good pilot team was because of what I would do for those pilots. And I do want to win a state championship. I don't know if I tell him about this, but I do want to win a state championship one more time because the national chairman is from Indiana. And three years ago, we won a state championship, and I got a letter that we hadn't won it because they had changed the champions, the, the team from a 10-man team, and ladies, don't take this personal. I got four daughters. They changed it from a, a seven-man a teenager, a woman, and a master, and that we had to turn in our 10-man team roster, and this team that they turned in had actually beat us. Now, that's after we got back home. It was about a 300-mile drive. I get this letter a few days later. Mm -hmm. Well, the national chairman said that, I said, how can you have on the telephone a, a team? I said, a 10-man team is what I always be. He said, well, we've changed it. It's seven men, one woman, one teenager and one master. I said, well, there ain't nothing I can do about it. Well, I got an engineer on my team, and so he started, he said, hey, that entry farm didn't say that. So we went to the wall and went to, it had gotten powerlifting USA, and it made me look bad. He meets. So I got one more meet to go to, and I got to sneak a team in. I got to send a team roster in on the last day, and I'm going to send in, but I ain't sending in body weights. And they ain't going to know much about it until they get there. And I'm going to do my best to win the state championship one more time because in Indiana, they, they literally have, have taken the pit personal. We have won too many state championships. So much for all this stuff. Let me tell you about powerlifting and what I would do today if I was a powerlifter. Or when I train powerlifters today, this is what I do. The first thing, you got to teach a guy how to squat. And you got to teach him how to squat deep enough, especially if you're from the pit. I've got a 114-pounder who is about as cocky as you can get. The hardest guy to deal with is 114-pounder. <laughs> because if he gets pretty good, he is something else. And you've got to have one man because there's none out there, and ladies, and that one that other team. You've got to have a 114-pounder. And so I treat him like a son, and I bend over backwards to get along with him. But he is a mess. <laughs> and, and, and we was up in Chicago, and they, they have a meet up there called the uh, Viking Open. Nice meet. 
And we're up there, and he goes, I said, go up there and get the team trophy when they call for it. Okay, because he's like, okay. So went up there and got the team trophy, and the lady said, well, you guys won again. He said, what else? Well, that's not the way you do things. You try to, you know, be nice, be, be, uh, be one of the guys, and not try to shove anything down anybody's throat. But if today I was training, I would, first of all, and if I was training guys, and I still do, and training people for piloting, you got to get them, you got to teach them how to squat, you got to teach them how to squat correctly. Now, I don't have a lot of time when I'm training people, because I also train wrestlers from modern day high school. Modern day high school is one of the last five state championships in Indiana. They're the winningest high school team reserve in the history of America, and their coach was a 1999 uh, wrestling coach of the year in America. And I train a bunch of the wrestlers, although they don't want them to come to the pit. This thing is so tied in with their father, these wrestlers, and, and, and this whole thing is, 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 is such a family deal. Their fathers, will, I'll get eight or ten of them every year. So I train these guys, and I train some other people. I, I, I don't, and don't think it's personal. You guys are the personal trainers. I don't charge anybody because I don't want to train you. I just ignore you after a while. So I don't want to be trained. A guy paying me. If anybody pays me, then I then then, then I, they own me. I owe them. They owe me. I own them. They own me. And I don't want that. And and the pit is a funny place. Uh, Walla Village talking about running somebody out of a gym by working them too hard. Um, our attitude is have the price go low to join, then try to make them quit. That way you don't have so many people around. We got over 600 members right now. And uh, it's a poorly run place with a lot of good equipment. We have full line and true line, uh, except two pieces. We got we bought eight or ten pieces of equipment in the last two years and what have you. But as far as the business, we've been in the business for all, all 30 years, and we still use a can. It's a coffee can, the first coffee can we had. We still don't have no cash register. We don't have nothing like that. You come in, you want to join up, you sign this piece of paper, we put your money in the can, and you come back with your key. That's, that's it. We may never see you again, but we don't care if you come back. Because my partner's worth $3 million. I don't know when he's going to show up. And uh, I'm not worth much, but i got nothing else to do. And I'm 62, and I'm a retired police officer, and I've got it going on Social Security here in a couple of months, and my wife's got a pretty decent job, and I hope you keep working. So <laughs> I'm pretty uninterested, too, unless you make me interested. So I've got to have help for you to make me interested. So you've got to learn to squat if you're going to power lift. Now, I've tried to find a whole lot of ways to do that lazy. And I don't have much energy left. I don't have any decent joints. And I don't, don't like showing people anymore. So it, 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 it's been a long time coming to me. How can I teach people how to squat? And over the years, I come up with what I call a negative squat. I've rolled in powerlifting USA has never got there. I guess he just doesn't think it works. But it's the best way to teach a guy to squat. It's the simplest thing that I've come up with. It's two sets of five on a negative squat. And all you gotta do is you teach a person to put the bar down as far as low on the back as they can. Because the further down you got the bar, the more leverage you Teach the person, I used to teach them to keep their arms in, but you can't get a deep breath. So I've taught them, and they'll learn it from Louis, and get your hands out as far as you can. And you teach this person to keep their feet out as far as they can comfortably. Hands down, everything's down. Bar down low. And go back, beat the back of your hips, and you go down. I ain't going down because my hips ain't worth coming up with. I don't have a kneecap on my right leg. But you reach back to your hips, break parallel, and come back up. Knees out. Always knees out. Reaching back. Don't squat down. Reach, reach back with your hips. Now, now the, the negative is 10 seconds down. Now, people might say, how can a person get stronger doing a 10-second down squat? Now, I, I also have them turn around relatively slow and then drive up. But the turnaround is relatively slow. I, I found out years ago, when, when Nautilus convinced me to try negative work entirely for a while in the gym, that it was a teaching thing, if nothing else. Negatives would teach you to do things right. I mean, you could take a guy that, that, that come in 
some some high school. And he would do. Uh, and, and, and I, I had machines back then. I mean, I sold gems. I don't know how many gems I sold. But I mean, I had machines designed where a big guy on each side, and you'd be sitting on the floor, and you'd grab all this, these grips like this, and there'd be, a, but you'd be sitting on the floor on the seat, and a guy would lift up on each side. So we had a negative gem on us. And then you'd let it down. Well, that got off of tying after a while. Mm -hmm. Trying to teach guys to do all that stuff. But one thing I recognized, those guys that let that weight down slow, when you put them back to train and to run the other one, hey, they would train right for a long time. I mean, they wouldn't bounce and jerk and yank. They would train real smooth. So it come on, come on my brain one day to use negative squats. And I have done that now with everybody who will listen to me. And I can teach it real quick. I have a guy who can break, break a little parallel because it's hard to really tell if a guy's moving fast if he gets a little parallel. So. I teach a guy that, and he really gets good at, at, at going down. And it's one other thing that I believe. I believe the muscles that support the supportive muscles are strengthened on a negative squat, just like they are on any negative work or barbell or, or dumbbell work. A machine doesn't do that as good. It doesn't work the supportive muscles as good, although it isolates better. So, you know, if, you're, if, a, if you want to argue back and forth, a, a machine will isolate your shoulders better, a good machine will. It won't work the supportive muscles as well as a dumbbell press will. Because if you do a dumbbell press, you'll feel the muscles in the upper back working more than you will with a good, like the True Lines press machine. That thing will, work, will isolate the heck out of your deltoid, but it doesn't work the supportive muscles well. Well, I have found out that a negative squat works the supportive muscles on a squatter real well. And so what you do, you have a teaching thing there that's, that I can't beat. And so that's the way I teach my guys to squat. And um, I say guys because I haven't trained too many women, but I had a lady come to me here lately. She's about 47 years old. And she wanted to powerlift, and I thought, man, man, what does this woman want to powerlift for? She's one time she weighed 270, and she's down to 170 now. She's done a heck of a job with herself, but she wanted to power it. And I thought, well, this will last two weeks at the most. <laughs> well, it didn't. She's a tough old gal. I mean, she's, she dresses to fit to kill. She comes in there looking like, I know she spent a lot of money. Her husband calls her high something money-wise, you know. She's got a good job and all that. But the last person I ever thought, and I wouldn't, wouldn't have said yes. I said, no, I ain't training you. But her... Her relation works out there. His name was Tim Mooney. He was an ex-pro football player. And, I, and, and Tim had been a good man to me, and plus he's about 286 foot two, and I felt like it might be conducive for me to go along with him. He suggested I train her. So, so I, 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 she's one of the first women I've ever trained in powerlifting, and she's doing well. Well, I couldn't do anything with her. I could not teach that woman to squat for nothing. And she would look at me when I could, you see, you can't train women the same way you train men. They don't take that verbal abuse too good. They, and she didn't take it too well either. One day I said, you know why Lombardi quit Green Bay? No. I said, it's because he got tired of making people be what they wanted to be. Now, you're the one who wants to be a powerlifter. But when I switched her to the negative squat, she caught on real quick. It was as much coaching fault as it was hers. But when I switched her that... 10 seconds down, and we do five reps. Two sets, that's all we do. That's all we squat, once a week, two sets of five. So a program would look like this, and I squat on Friday. I have my team squat on Friday because I think it takes less out of the lower back than the deadlift does. Now we only deadlift twice a month. So our workout would be, on the Friday we'll come in and we'll squat and normally, I'll have about five supplementary exercises. That's all I have a person do. After they've done two sets of five on a negative squat, I'll have them do about five other exercises. One set. And that's all I do. Now, if a person is willing, and I've had the fastest gainer I ever had in powerlifting would have been better than the guy I just mentioned if I could ever keep him in there. But every time I put him on his on his routine, he'd quit me. And I only trained him six times a month. 
and it was out, all the assistance work was super slows. Super slows do build strength. I, I, I don't sell this stuff. I don't care whether you're doing or what. I went down to that school, and I'm probably the only guy that he ever trained, or he ever took. I flunked. Because <laughs> I went down there, and I thought, man, I've been in this game too long. I, this guy can't know this. I passed these written tests. He put me in a room by myself. There wasn't no cheating. I passed these written tests, but I didn't know he sent me 10 papers typewritten on how to get in and out of a machine. I thought, well, I know how to tell you how to get in and out of a machine. Well, I didn't know how to do it like he said. <laughs> and he had, he had 10 different machines, and I'd never even seen a, a MedEx leg press, plus one thing, the thing he'd made, and he retrofitted machines and everything else. And it, I mean, he took a knowledge machine. I didn't know what it looked uh, it looked like a knowledge machine. But anyway, I learned super slows from him, although it cost me $500 to flunk the <laughs> get in and out of the machine. Because I had to use the way he said it on the paper, how to get in a leg curl out of it. You're kidding me. He's an annoying kid. And he's honest, and he's arrogant, and he's intelligent. And I flunked. And my wife says, is that guy, when I come back to her, I flunked. She says, well, was that guy real, or what's the deal? I said, is he just trying to get your mouth? I said, no, he was real honest. He, I just flunked. But anyway, super slows do work. Uh, like I said, I don't teach super slows. I'm not no super slow gym. I'm not into that at all. Uh, you can use whatever you want while you're there, uh, as long as you don't tear up equipment. But I have to get a guy there now for that for that because we get a key membership. But anyway, back to the power lift, and we do them two sets of squats. And my favorite low back over the years, I got a reverse hyper. I got an upright hyper, which an upright hyper is a good tool. But my favorite tool is just a plain old hyperextension to strengthen your lower back. And probably on that squat day in most guys, but we've got a hyperextension that has a cable attachment hooked to a weight stack to put around your neck. And the cable runs back underneath, so you have a change of resistance that's kind of by accident that's pretty decent. So we use the hyperextension, and I like to see a guy do them slow, if he will. And like I said, the best gain I ever had was on a guy who was supplemental. Obviously, he done all, he done his squat, bench, and deadlift the normal speed and style, but he used super slows on all his supplemental work. And he used to look at me, and that guy went. And, and, and the back, where I really made a mistake, the guy's a preacher. And where I really made the mistake was getting him out of the 181 pound class. This guy went out of the 181 pound class. See, you go to contests on Sunday, uh, on Saturday and Sunday, you have. These contests are Saturday, usually 181, 114, 181 lifts. Then the next day, well, this guy went to 220 on these supers. You know? Well, he got to preach on something. <laughs> and he would feel real guilty about being at a powerlifting meet. So I eventually lost him from that and super slopes. But I, I, really, I really thought he was going to make me a name. But anyway, uh, they do work. And when I can encourage people to use them, I do encourage them to use them. But everything works. Again, what you want to do is not get hurt. Overtraining can get you hurt, just as well as anything else. But on that day, we do those two sets of squats. We do the hyperextension. Sometimes we'll do a leg press, but most of the time we'll do the leg press on the deadlift. We will do shoulder work on that day. Normally, I'll have a guy do, keep it simple, two sets of squats, one set of hyperextensions, a seated press, a couple sets of, of 10 on a seated press, and then side bends. you got to have side bends in there if you're going to be a pilot. You've got to build those obliques. They're more important than, than your sit-up work for, for a strong abs. You've got to have strong obliques. And that's about all we'll do on that day. And that's after since, I've been training part of it since 1975, and that's about all they can stand, and especially after they become strong. The young guy that comes in, he can take more if he's weak. Weak people, you can't wear out. <laughs> <laughs> but if a guy can squat 500 for 10, you can wear that guy out real quick. <laughs> but it'd be impossible to wear me out. I'm too weak. And uh, so you got to you got to realize that, and, and so I... I figure, you know, start this guy out, keep him around. Now, powerlifters, I treat all together different than I do wrestlers. I, I try to get rid of wrestlers. And uh, Linda Joe, I'll go mention about 
uh, child abuse. Mm. Them wrestlers would do unbelievable things at, at that level. I mean, that team, modern day, when they won the last five state championships, and I know I'm getting off the study, but it's so interesting. Five, last five state championships in Indiana, and uh, they go all over the country. They go to Missouri, they go to Tennessee, they go to Alabama, and they win, win, win. Don't go to Iowa. They get close. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, they're, they're good. But the things they will do, I've heard stories that like sitting in class, they had to go get a guy this year with an animal, passed out in class. Sitting in class with wet towels on your head, what's the teacher thinking? Guy's dehydrated, but he ain't going to drink nothing because he's got to make weight, but he's got a wet towel in class. But there's a big deal there, and I hope Linda Joe don't ever go down to modern day and start telling the child abuse because it'd be Linda Joe abuse. <laughs> I mean, you don't tell them anything about that thing. It, it, you know, it's, it, it's important to them. But anyway, when I train them, they all train super slow. That's the only way I train them. Because it gets rid of those that don't want to train in a hurry. And I only use five exercises on them twice a week. Okay, you got the squat day, the deadlift day. We come in one set of deadlifts is all we ever do. Twice a month. That's two sets a month. Now, who in the world wants to do any more of it? It's an exercise or movement that nobody really likes unless his arms hang to his, hands hang to his knees <laughs> and his hips are up around his shoulders. <laughs> that kind of guy likes to dead uh, But I can't find too many of those guys. I'll look for them. You look for body proportions if you want powerlifters. You look for little guys, body proportions, and that kind of thing. You don't look for people that want to be powerlifters that come in and say, I want to be a powerlifter. Because normally they can't be a powerlifter, you look for them. But deadlift is one set of ten, and I have switched in the last, what have you, to trying to teach people to do a negative deadlift. Because I've become so impressed with what it's done for the squat. All that is, is if you're using your narrow foot, is you do a regular deadlift, and then you let it down for ten seconds. It is very safe. It eliminates the chance of injury a great deal because you can't handle much weight. And all I can say is it works. I've had a power lifter. Uh, I've got a, a 198 pounder who's a good power lifter. And uh, he's, a, he's a tool and die maker. And he's, he's smart enough that to realize that, hey, there's a better way to do things. Let's see if this works. Let's see if that works. And he's went to all negative work. In other words, he'll do his bench, bring her down 10 seconds, pop it right up. He does a deadlift the same way because he's got results from that type of work. So on that deadlift day, we'll do that deadlift. We'll do an up, some upper back work. We've got hammer strength things we use. I've got a low roll. I use a low roll instead of a bent over roll. I like a rowing exercise of some type. And if you don't have a low roll, I would use a dumbbell because the bent over roll is a dangerous exercise. And if you just got through doing deadlift, the last thing you want to do is a bent over roll. So do a dumbbell roll where you got your knee propped up and you can, you'll get the same result. And a pull down, or if you're big and can't do it, or, or if you're little, do a pull up. A chin up is better, or pull up, better than a pull down in my opinion because again, it's working the abdominals a little bit harder. Although, uh, there's arguments the other direction. You know, you, you can do things with both things that are good. But we'll do two upper back, and we'll do a shrug, and we'll do some abdominal work, and that's all we do. And we only do that now twice a month. Every other Monday, my powerlifters don't work out. Every other Monday. Because the deadlift, I believe, is takes so much out of a person, and it's not something everybody loves to do. And I really believe we could have won the deadlift nationals every year they've ever had it. Because I can get 10 guys there, and nobody in the world can. Nobody can get 10 deadlifters to a contest that's got a gym in the world. But you hit Because I've seen out there in New York when we was up there that one time. I just quit going because it was easy to win. And I thought they said they could do it. They could win it if they, because he would keep his team out of it up there. And they might have probably could have because we had to travel. But I've seen some guys sitting together up there who could have beat us to death if they'd been deadlifting on a regular basis but they weren't doing it. 
you got to do this at least twice a month. You got to do it to be good at it. I have found out I've taken, I've taken a, a lot of guys in prison. We've been a lot of prison meets. Till I get, till one found out I was a policeman and I got a little sick. One, I was in Marion Federal Penitentiary, getting off the subject again. But I was in Marion Federal Penitentiary one time with my team. And Marion Federal Penitentiary was the most sophisticated penitentiary in, of its time in that day and age. Kennedy was the one that had it built. It was the number one federal penitentiary where they put the mafia people and what have you. And the guy walks right up beside me and says, we heard about you and laughed. But what he had heard about me was an article in the newspaper that I was a police officer training some guys. And so I didn't go back in the prisons much after that. But I have found in prison some of the best deadlifters you've ever seen. <laughs> I don't know whether it's the mentality of a prisoner or what it is, but the, 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 they, they, they do deadlifts. Or whether it's easy to learn or whether... And it's a good thing to take something out of it. Grab the bar and jerk and yank on it. But I've seen, I, I seen the most phenomenal lifter on, in a deadlift in a prison. The guy was about 6'1", 181. The black guy. And he walked up to a guy I had named Paul White. And Paul White was about a 730 uh, deadlifter. And he says, big boy, I got you today. <laughs> now that's that they squatted and benched on the deadlift. And I looked at this guy, and Paul White looked at him, and I said, you don't know what you're talking about, man. But this guy pulled about 760 at 181 to 61. And, 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 and I've seen other guys like that in the prison, so I don't know why prisoners are good at deadlift, but believe me, it's a valuable exercise. And you ought to learn to do it correctly because I can see these guys, I, you know, I can, I can go out and I can look at people and they've got their shirts off and, and you can tell a deadlift. He's got a look about it. And it, it's, it's something that, it, that it gives you a little more quality that, you know, I was talking a while ago about, you know, uh, about um, Columbo. Well, Columbo supposedly was an 800-pound deadlifter, and I'm not denying what he could do. But it, it, you know, and Schwarzenegger was supposedly a 700-pound deadlifter. They were both done some powerlifting as, as as such as it was done back in those days. But I mean, the deadlift is a valuable exercise, even if you just want to look good. But do it correctly, because it becomes dangerous exercise. And don't do it over twice a month. You don't need to do it over twice a month. It'll get the job done. On Wednesday, we bench. Again, we deadlift on Mondays twice a month. We squat on Fridays four times a month, and we bench. And anybody can teach a bench press, right? Uh, and anybody can get anybody to do a bench press. Well, I got my own beliefs about the bench press. Don't coach it. Just let them do what they want to do, because they're going to do what they want to do anyway. <laughs> but the only thing I teach them is pause on your chest because there's probably going to be a judge there that don't exactly think too much of you. So, so learn to pause on that bench. But if the guy wants me to make out his workout, I'll have a couple sets of benches. And I'll have two sets of two, three sets of five. And that's it. Along with some assistance work with a bench press shirt in this day and age, you have to train triceps. Because the bench, the, the, the shirt's lifted up the first four inches with the shirt. I mean, with the bars, they the first one with the shirt. You're not doing anything. And once you learn how to use it, a correctly put on shirt, correctly fitted, will give you four inches on your bench. So why train like the guys used to with a bent bar and develop big pecs? You don't need them. You need deltoids and triceps. So we do deltoid work to some degree, and we do tricep, which would be whatever you want to do. But you do need tricep work because the tricep basically in this day and age with the shirt carries the load. And if you notice, uh, a lot of the guys nowadays, people will use a closer grip on the bench press than they used to because, again, the bench shirt being what it is, uh, it helps. And secondly, a lot of the guys you see in a magazine are on drugs and they get pec tears, whereas they don't get tricep tears. But I don't teach my people to use a close grip. I teach them to use a fairly wide grip. But that's just a preference thing. But again, you do need tricep and shoulder work. Always, we've got a hammer strength rotator cuff machine. I haven't used that. 
the rotator cuff work in the last five years has been written in hard gainer was beyond me. I never realized the importance of the rotator cuff work five years ago, until about five years ago, when a guy in California wrote a book on rotator cuff, and I got it and read it, and it's extremely important. We bought the machine, and maybe a little further back than five years. But we do rotator cuff work, and sometimes we'll do a couple of things for the rotator cuff. We also, again, do ab work one of those days and side day. So if you can get the picture there with all my storytelling of how we put together a, a uh, program, that's a general program that, that I would put most people through. Again, I don't sell super slow, but they do work, but everything works. And I have never been able to figure out from reading, I've, I've sit and talked to Arthur Jones, and I went to other clinics, I've spoken clinics far away as Cleveland, I still don't know about fast twitch and slow twitch and all that stuff. I don't know. I know I can find something written to whatever you say that's the opposite if you want me to find it. In fact, I gave all my books away. I had the greatest collection of Iron Man ever, anybody ever had. I had them hard back. They sent them from Indiana University. I had the second issue. I would be kicked all the way out of this place. And I'm going to trash. And I, and I heard now it's worth about 500 bucks or what. <laughs> but I mean, I had these things, the guys, they, they sent to me, and the other they sent me, his, they, were, they hardbacked all these uh, Iron Man, and I'd give them away. Because I got to the place I didn't want to read nothing. Because I've become just like you will become, confused. <laughs> I mean, here I am, 62 years old, I'm afraid to read anything. Because when I get through reading, I thought, am I doing this right? You better believe in what you're doing. I'm going to tell you something, the best thing i got going for me at coaching is trophies. Because when they look at me, they say, what does that guy know about weightlifting? We've won 101 team trophies, and I'll make sure you see them. <laughs> <laughs> and the best thing I got going for me is the guy believes in them. If he believes in me, then he don't be reading the book and believe in something else. I trained a kid who was two-time state champion in wrestling. And he goes off to Indiana University. And he comes back confused. No better place to get confused than at university. <laughs> I got another guy I went to the Air Force. He comes back. He was a junior in high school. His uncle was a football coach, but he was not penciled in as a starter or anything as a junior because he didn't even start on a reserve team as a sophomore. He done super slows for one summer. He broke the tackling record at defensive end for the school as a junior. I'm doing super sports. He was a starter. His, I, I, my my, my uh, brother-in-law was a coach of a team at He was talking about this defensive end, how they were going to try to stop him as a senior. They went to the state championship game. He joined the Air Force, and he don't do no super slows anymore. He does what the Air Force does. Now, it all works. But if I tell you it all works, when you come in my gym, there you go say, this guy ain't got no idea of what works. He says it all works. But you got to have somebody believing in you, and you, you got to believe in yourself. If you're, if you're on a program, get yourself a good, simple program if you're a powerlifter. Make sure you do squats and deadlifts and benches. And get you some exercises that you have found work you hard that isolate the low back and the abdominal area and the shoulder area and the upper back area. One other thing I forgot to tell you. There's one other thing I do do, and I don't know how I forgot it. My wife said, where's your notes? And I said, I don't need no notes. <laughs> Is I do, a, I do a manual resistance leg curl on my deadlift there. Because I don't think leg curls work good for some reason on a machine. I've got to do manual. So I have a guy get on it. He does the leg curl up with a light weight, and I pull him down. And we do it for two minutes. And I'm hollering at him and begging and telling my old man to pull him down. And everything I can do to get this guy to work his hamstrings. On that, on that manual uh, negative work. And it's the best hamstring work I've ever got out of a person. Uh, and I think it's very important. Uh, and I forgot to tell you that. So if, if there's any questions, I'll...